Hey guys, Montel here, and welcome to another episode of Let's Be Blunt with Montel. Quality, safety, and the pursuit of normalization and normalizing cannabis are more important today than they've ever been. Whether you're a longtime advocate or a new to the scene, understanding the science behind cannabis quality is key to pushing the industry forward. Today, we have a very special guest joining us. He's the president and founder of the Institute of Cannabis Science. As a leader in cannabis research and policy advocacy, he'll share his insights on how to ensure that cannabis we consume meets the highest standards of quality and safety and what steps we can take as a community to bring about the normalization of cannabis. He earned his PhD in chemistry at Duke University and was a postdoctoral fellow at both Harvard University and the Institute of Inorganic Chemistry in Germany. Dr. Jeff Rawson, thank you so much for being here and being a part of Let's Be Blunt with Montel, sir. Well, thank you so much for having me and for the great introduction. Absolutely, sir, and thank you for being here. Look, let's let's start a little bit by telling me a little bit about yourself. Where did you grow up, where you went to school, all those kind of things, and when did you become interested in cannabis? <laughs> yeah, that's kind of funny. Um, so I, I, I was born in uh, New Orleans, and I, I grew up in the South, and um, uh, I, I mostly grew up in Florida, so I really think of myself now as a Floridian kind of um, in origin. Um, I lived there till high school, and then I went away for education. But um, like when I was a kid, I was actually um, like I was kind of like a really careful rule follower, and so I actually stayed away from like that. I was nervous about the weed. Um, Boy. Yeah, yeah. But you know, the funny thing was that I gravitated, like I have an outsider kind of a character and I tended to always gravitate towards the outsiders. I listened to Pink Floyd. I, I wore a bunch of tie dye. So like everyone kind of made assumptions, Sure. <laughs> but I actually yeah. didn't try weed until uh, like I was in college um, with some friends. And then like the, from the very first time I tried, it, I was like, oh, that yeah. 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 <laughs> right. And when you first tried it, were you a flower smoker, a key smoker, a vapor? What were you? The first weed I had was like some like awful brick weed that my friend picked up off a corner in Poughkeepsie on his way to another friend's house. And some cop like pulled him over and took his pipe but they didn't get the weed. And so then he managed to get to us. And so he smoked it off a can. <laughs> <laughs> and of course that first experience is what set the pace for the rest, right? Yeah. 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 And then like, I had like a bunch of times, like those little, those, those, those little stubby things is like the early 2000s. Sure. 90s, sure. So. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, that's my first experience with cannabis, but like I was straight up chemist. Um, super interested in really fundamental stuff. I actually worked on like quantum mechanics, you know, kind of esoteric things like that. I always had a hard time explaining to people like what it was I did. <laughs> but, but, what, um, what, what, did you, what did you actually go to school for? So I went to school for chemistry and what I really, I mean, I liked being in the lab and like making molecules, you know, like build molecules, do reactions. It's kind of like you work with your hands some, but there's a lot uh, that you're inferring from microscopic, like invisible things. And, you know, so, um, you know, it was, it was, it was appealing to me, I guess. And, um, uh, but through my education and as I went up, like doing physical organic chemistry, learning more physics and kind of like, yeah, getting more into quantum mechanics and crazy stuff and interactions between light and matter. It's all very interesting to me, but like kind of hard to talk about with other, with the lay people. And, um, I was at this postdoc in Germany and I was with these people. They were so narrow and they were so deep. And I realized this is just not me. Like, this is not where I belong. Like I am a kind of like, I like to look for connections between things. And in Germany, I mean, it was the, 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 cult, the research culture at the place I was at, I think was sort of an extreme, but like we were studying like single molecules one molecule at a time with uh, scanning uh, probe microscopes. Um, it's really fancy stuff, you know, so you have to be really narrow and kind of focused. But I just realized I wanted to do something totally different. So I took a second postdoc at Harvard with George Whitesides, who's this 
um, guy that's kind of, he's a chemist who's sort of known for like doing stuff that really reaches out of chemistry. Um, and uh, so I, I tried a bunch of projects he hated. And then one, uh, I, I, and I was actually kind of the heel of the group, like I was the crappiest guy. So um, uh, like I couldn't figure out what to do, like and how to work with him. Um, it's like one of these really high power groups. And I was like out of my league kind of with like the culture of it. So um, what happened was then I got e Valley. Do you remember the vaping illness? Sure. Yeah. So I was using e-cigs and I was buying them on the black market. And um, and I, I got, I mean, I got really sick basically. And I spent a couple of weeks at the hospital. And slow, um, that, slow that down a little bit because yeah. you, know, now you had been, now you were getting this out of the gray market, black market, or are you buying these um, from legal dispensaries? Yeah, oh, no. It's like a um, website. It's black market. And I mean, I think, I mean, I started buying them. I started buying weed that way before um, dispensaries opened for rec in Massachusetts. Got it. Um, Got yeah. it. Yeah. And you have been you've been consuming some of these gray market e cigs for a while, a long time, or just a couple months. My gosh, I mean, maybe about six months. Um, yeah, I think I, I've been. Yeah, I've, I've been a pretty frequent user for about six months. Um, yeah. Now, you know, now let me ask you. you know, and, and had you experimented with any legal ones, or were there weren't any legal ones at the time that you were doing this? Yeah, I mean the. The ones from the website were delivered to me and that was like made it a lot more that made it a lot simpler for me because that like at first there weren't i mean yeah when i moved to massachusetts dispensaries ha hadn't opened yet for rec and right. it was just rolling out there was almost nothing um so it was like not easy to get to um but you know i could get someone to deliver it to me like on a friday night and like it'd be like real surreptitious right so yeah. Yeah. And, and you, I guess, you know, like like so many people who were consuming those back in the day, you were assuming that this was a good, viable product. These people were using good standards and making a good product that would be safe, right? Well, I mean, you know, that's kind of a funny question because, like, I think, honestly, like, for me, the e-cigs are, like, really, like, I got, like, really hooked on it. Like, I was hitting it, like, all the time. And I think I just stopped thinking about it. Like, I didn't, yeah, I don't think I really asked myself. I didn't look at it critically. Um, well, you know, it's really, it's even, really I haven't even heard of the vaping illness. That's right? the stupid. That's how. That's how much. That's how much I was able to delude myself. Because I had even heard of the vaping illness, but I was like, "Well, but I mean, it's not going to happen to me." Like, <laughs> well, you know, it's very interesting because way back, you know, I, I will tell you, I literally my transition with cannabis. You know, I was uh, I stopped smoking flour almost within the first three years of smoking. I, I literally, I, I had a person who gave, who delivered to me some Keef and I was completely blown away by the Keef. It was like, Oh, but this is it. I can't do nothing else. So I literally for, I'm telling you easily mm, six years, seven years from like, you know, I, 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 I my history with cannabis goes on, off, on, off. I smoked some when I was a kid, stopped when I went in the military for a long period of time, got out of the military. Um, like 1991 is when I started my show. And, you know, a little bit before that, I had been out of the military for a couple of years and didn't smoke at all. And um, probably around 1991, right when I, I moved to LA and um, I was getting ready to launch the Monta Williams show. And it's very interesting because I always often say to people, you know, most people who gravitate to cannabis over alcohol do so for some underlying medical reason, even if they don't know what that is. And up until the time that I started utilizing cannabis, I have to tell you something. I was a really, I was a pretty, pretty heavy drinker. I had become a heavy drinker while I was in the military. Um, I was part of the submarine force and submarine force and military prides itself in being, you know, functional drunks. Um, part of the culture. Yeah. It was part of culture. Cause you, back then we used to pull in after missions in the Holy Lock, Scotland. So, you know, to be a real man, you know, you went off the ship on the first night with a couple of your buddies, you went out and everybody bought a fifth and put it in front of himself, pouring glasses, you know, <laughs> you know, so I, I was, I was a pretty heavy consumer of, uh, brown liquors. And then um, 
I started now, unbeknownst to me, I literally was starting to experience some symptoms of MS that had never been diagnosed. So I, I kept feeling like there's something, maybe there's something is alcohol that's really making me feel bad. It's giving me this pain in my feet. It's good. You know, maybe I have gout. I don't know. Uh, so I try to ease off the alcohol. And then I, I went to, I, I'll never forget, I went to a, a party um, in LA and, you know, Everybody, there was, there was a group of people out by the pool and out by the back porch, and there were a group of people in this dark room down the hallway. And I was like, "What are they doing?" And I went down the hallway and I, oh, they smoked a pot. Hmm, I remember this. The man got a little soak, and you know, I hit that, and I really almost like almost instantaneously transitioned from alcohol to cannabis. I'm not, 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 this is where I need to be because I feel better. And then. You know, as I continue my journey with cannabis, this is 91, mid-92, you know, I started seeking out cannabis back then. And I was still smoking flour, but, you know, I heard about this stuff, saw Keith, and, you know, I started doing that. And that, let's say, probably from early 90s till 2000, I was probably a one-day-a-week, two-day-a-week smoker, maybe – I, you know, maybe I might grab a little taste on the third day, but most of the time, no. It was weekends and, you know, do my thing. And then um, as my MS started progressing to the point that I finally got diagnosed, I realized that, you know, because I was doing a little bit of cannabis and a little bit of alcohol, and then I started realizing that this alcohol is like destroying me, so I got to get off of this. I stopped the alcohol. And then... You know, when I finally got diagnosed with MS, I got diagnosed because I was I went through an episode or a bout where I had extreme neuropathic pain in my lower extremities, my side, and my face. I had trigeminal neuralgia. There was a whole bunch of weird things going on. And, you know, opioids just would not the solution, uh, even though I chased opioids for about a year and a half to the point that I was at one point in time taking about 16 Vicodin a day, 17 a day. I was taking a uh, towel and I was taking all kinds of things that, you know, it just was not giving me the relief. And I had a doctor who started to finally figure out that I was not only getting prescriptions from him, but I was getting prescriptions from other folks who called him up and said, did you write a prescription for him? And, and this doctor who was a good friend who said, cutting you off, dude, I'm not going to give you any more opioids. That's a good doctor. It was the best thing I could have ever. Cause, and why? Because I was going back to the doctor saying, I mean, honestly, not, I'm not trying to be gross here, but I was having some real serious digestive issues because I was destroying my my IG. I, my entire digestional tract was was literally um, I was literally going to have kidney failure because uh, I was doing so much. So he shut me down and said to me, "This was back in 2000 uh, when I got diagnosed, and uh, about 2000 and a half." He said to me, "Look, I'm not going to write you any more prescriptions for opioids, but I'm going to or for any of these these pain medications." However, I've heard from some people who have MS, and this is a, a top neurologist at Harvard, believe it or not, who said to me, um, look, I've heard uh, some people who've come in my office and anecdotally have told me that they have the same type of neuropathic pain that you do, similar to you, and they get some really incredible relief from using this stuff called marijuana. If I were you, you're a smart guy, you know, study it, figure it out. There's some certain type of marijuana that works better than others. It's like the CBDBD or something. I don't know. So I don't know what it is, but you can just look it up. And I literally just jumped two feet headfirst into the research of cannabis as hard as I could back in 2000, 2001. Started understanding that there was a difference between CBD and THC and some of the other minor cannabinoids that had already been identified. And I, back in 2001, started seeking it before anybody in this entire industry was even talking about CBD. I started seeking out very heavily laden CBD products. Came across a, a, a grower in uh, Northern California who said, "Look, you know, if you want that stuff, I got, I got, <laughs> I got jars of this uh, Keef." that's pretty high in CBD. I think it's maybe about 12, 13%. I'll just give it to you, dude, because nobody really wants that stuff. I was like, really? This is crazy. This is the best stuff in the world. So I literally started my journey about 2001, finding very, very, very heavily laden CBD products on the West Coast and the East Coast. And it was, and I figured, let me get 
out of the flower world and just go to the keef world because it's higher concentration and I'll get a better euphoria, but I'll also get this pain relief. Started doing that. And I mean, I never looked back. And so I was a big keef smoker for nine years before I ventured into the cart or the vape thing. And the first time I tried vaping, I had to tell you, I really didn't like it because first of all, it seemed very harsh. And, you know, I kept, and I went to a person who literally was a, you know, a producer and manufacturer back before, you know, the legalization was really running rapid. Now I spent 2002 to 2008, 9, 10 traveling the country, you know, extolling the virtues of cannabis for various illnesses, especially for mine. And, even went to Israel, sat down with Dr. Mashulam in his office in Israel for a couple hours. And then I actually put him on film um, talking about the research that he had done. And I, you know, for me, again, vaping was not, you know, on my high list because, first off, I didn't like the fact that almost all vapes back then were extracted using butane. And I was like, yeah. excuse me, if I wouldn't put my mouth on the exhaust pipe of a car, and suck that in. I put my mouth on something like this. It's got this cost, and I don't give a shit. What you tell me when you tell me, oh, we had a touch of, and there's only like you know three parts per million. That is not the silly because I knew that would be why because nobody knew what they were testing back then anyway. And it wasn't yeah. until it wasn't until I discovered CO two, supercritical CO two, that I was like, okay, wait a second. Now I see because now we're talking about parts per billion. So therefore, this may be a little safer. And that's when I started the journey of vaping. Um, so, I mean, I didn't mean to get off track, but, you know, so when you first- Really started, interesting, actually. I mean, I'm glad you shared so much. Yeah, but I mean, so we, and I literally, you know, the industry is not like me much since 2010, in a sense, because I was the guy who literally back before, first off, before people were identifying other minor cannabinoids, I was already looking for the minor cannabinoids. I was looking for QEG, I was looking for CBD. I was talking about things that people was going over people's heads. And they were like, you know, what are you talking about? And then I started coming down on the industry for using butane. I literally spoke at every major cannabis convention in America for about five years in a row. And I would get up on stage and literally just immediately eviscerate anybody in that room that was selling, you know, butane carts. And people got mad at me because I wasn't, I wasn't holding back. And so for me, when I first started vaping, I literally found vape carts that were coming from, I got mine from China, but I literally reached out to the manufacturer and I said, you will put no chemicals in here at all once the cart is made. I don't need any preservatives. I don't need anything else. I just want the cart dry as a bone. They were, well, it's not going to last a lot. I don't give a shit. I'll throw it away. I'll buy another one. So, you know, I turned away from, tried to stay away from those caustic chemicals, even in the carts that I was developing. And I started actually developing products and started developing, you know, processes and started, became a part of the industry. And I, you know, so when you first started vaping, those questions, I'm, as a scientist, I'm just thinking those questions never crossed your mind? Yeah, you know, that's what's really funny. I mean, in my life, I was at such a, like, bad place that I think, like, I mean, the e cigs were pretty shitty. I mean, look, they made me sick, right? Like, <laughs> obviously, they weren't good. So, um, like, and I always preferred combustion anyway. Um mm -hmm. Although I, I like, I like concentrates. I like, I like hash and stuff. I like like, yeah, right. I like, eat, yeah. I, I like, I, I like, I like dabs. So, yeah. um, but um, this was like a, this was a bullshit way for me to stay high all the time and avoid other people basically. Right. And um, so I think I was sort of ignoring a lot at that time, honestly. And um, basically like I started having some shortness of breath and then, I mean, one day, I mean, I got so, like I would have these episodes of shortness of breath and I feel a little bit better again. Um, I could still like, I could still cycle around, like I'd bike around. Um, uh, but um, then one day I just started getting really sick and throwing up and I couldn't hold down any food. And I thought I had, I thought that, I, was, 
No, I'm sorry, because when I was reading yeah. some of the information you put out, that's what threw me. First, you thought it was a stomach virus, right? Or some sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, I thought I had like a stomach bug or something. So like, yeah, but I, I, I just basically stayed sick all weekend. And I was like trying to conceal, you know, like I was embarrassed about how much I was, you know, because I was like hitting these things all the time, like anytime right. nobody was looking, right? So sure. um, like basically what... Uh, yeah, what 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 in, like finally I felt so sick that I took a lift to Mount Auburn Hospital and um like spent a couple of weeks there, you know, and wow. had to like yeah. And, and when you got to the hospital, I, I talk, talk walk us through that. You, you did a really good job of some of the information you had given me, but you get to the yeah. hospital and you didn't first associate it with your vaping, did you? No, I actually I really thought I had a stomach bug. Kind of. I mean, I think I was sort of deluding myself. Like, you know, as you said, right? I mean, I mean, as a sign, I mean, I, I, I mean, I'm an NPR listener, dude. Right? right? Like, like I had actually heard of the vaping illness. So, like, like either I was uncharacteristically stupid, or I was like deluding myself some. Right. You know. Right. So I, I was, you know, I think, and and in a way, like getting sick like that, that was sort of like the best thing that happened to me because, like. I, I fully recovered. And um, after that, I wrote that column and it was published in the Globe. So my super high power advisor at Harvard actually read it. And he's a very critical writer. And so he actually thought it was good. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> and so then it. he was more interested in me, but he would only talk to me about electronic cigarettes and cannabis. So then I realized that that's my research project now. And I had to figure out how to do it without like as a postdoc at Harvard with like, right. yeah, which was kind of like, I mean, it's harebrained and crazy. He literally told me, well, we're not getting the DEA license because I'm not going to live that long. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like you just have to figure out like what research project you're going to do without actually you know, breaking the law or like really because you can get lab, you can get university labs in really serious trouble with their federal funders. Sure. If sure. But, but let, me, let me take you back to the hospital for just one more second. Though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely, there, definitely. You went through this whole pro you, you went in on a Sunday. Um, you, you actually admitted, you know, guys, I've been vaping and they, yeah. started, and they tried all kinds of things to see if they could help you get over whatever because, it was that was dealing with you. Yeah. Yeah. Because like, actually, because I, so because I lied at first, which, and this is really common when people have like, like bad habits and they're like not taking good care of themselves and they're in a really dark place. Like they tend to not be honest. Right. So, um, but that was me. And, um, so yeah, I, um, you know, I told them I thought it was a stomach bug. So they gave me antibiotics and like, then I didn't get better. And so they, yeah, they, they eventually, they actually kind of confronted me and they said, so like what other, things could be going on, you know, <laughs> kind of started asking a little more pointedly. Um, and, uh, you know, I was like pretty hypoxic. They were having like blow a lot of oxygen into me. So, um, yeah. So yeah, I, I eventually like kind of had to come clean and it was interesting. It was just at this point where they had pretty good information on how to treat it, but they didn't know that much about the consequences. So early on, they actually thought that my lungs might be like permanently wrecked. Um, but like they, uh, but they actually, what they did was they treated me with a super high dose of steroids. I don't remember which one. Um, and, um, like basically for like a few weeks, I was kind of like a, a roid Hulk and, um, my, and then my, my lungs like kind of regenerated and basically I, I hardly noticed the difference now. So, um, wow. like I'm really lucky. Really? But had you not told them you would have continued down a path, you were almost getting ready to have. Yeah. I mean. I was really lucky, you know, I was at Mount Auburn Hospital and there's a lot of really sharp people there. This is a, a really good research hospital. So, I mean, there are a lot of critical thinking people who would have kept asking questions. I think they would have, yeah. I mean, they did get it out of me, you know, I have to give them credit for getting it out of me. And so now, I mean, okay, so after having survived that, you seem to have just put you on a mission to make people understand, number one, how they're consuming, what they're consuming and what they should look for or not look at. And you know, what's, what's crazy though, my friend Jeff is that I, I, you know, you look at the industry even today, you know, two years, two years ago, 2021, 
we sold, I think, somewhere close to $25 billion worth of legal cannabis in America. And of course, the majority of that was closer to well, over 50% of that was flour, but vaping came second and edibles come third. And so, you know, we went through this period of time and I, I will bet you now, I, without any hesitation, I would think that those numbers have probably doubled. We sold $25 billion worth of, worth of legal cannabis, but we sold $70 billion worth of gray market illegal cannabis. And a lot of that gray market illegal cannabis there's no standard. There are yeah, people making this this crap in their basements. Maybe people making this crap in the kitchens, in the in their garages. Who don't care? I mean, I was I was shocked. I happen to be a producer of some products, and I have my products are in the marketplace in Massachusetts. Um, I have vape carts, and my vapes are produced by a licensed producer. Um, uh, they only use supercritical CO2 extraction. Um, ours are tested at least three times in the process. I feel very comfortable with my vapes. I've been using them myself personally for a while. Did you stop vaping completely when you came out of the hospital or did you look for a better product? Yeah, yeah. I um, yeah, I really stayed away from it for quite a while. I really had to, yeah, I, I, you know, I, and I had a kind of tumultuous uh, time in my life. Um, uh, you know, these, these pa pa past few years have been sort of an interesting transition. Um, so I, I, I kind of, I quit, I quit everything for a couple of years. Um, and, uh, um, and then, and then, then ev eventually like kind of gra you know, gravitated back, um, yeah. the, the, the way we do, I, I feel, I feel like I'm at a pretty comfortable place now. I tend to stick with, um, I tend to still stick with like, smoking flour. I mean, I really, really like concentrates. Um, but, uh, I, I just find that I tend to just keep doing more and like building up my tolerance until it's like ridiculous. So, right. Uh, right. I, you know, I'm ha kind of happy. I'm, I'm happier with where I stay a lot of times smoking flour and I actually enjoy it. So, um, yeah, you know, I, I think we all, you know, I, I, the ride and the journey with cannabis for everyone is more like a roller coaster. I think if you sit down with any real cannabis consumer, there are those who will tell you, oh, I'm baking as much as I have ever baked in my life. And others will say, you know, the journey is, you know, I'll take a ride up that roller coaster and take the ride down that roller coaster. And then sometimes I, you know, level out. Like for me, I will tell you that there was a period of time, you know, you say you like to dab. There was a period of time when I first started selling or, or actually, you know, providing product into the marketplace. I would do you know, um, experiences at various um, dispensaries in California that allow for next door to have consumption or, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I can recall, you know, ah, five years ago, no, more like seven, eight years ago, um, six, seven years ago, I did some dab events where I literally, I'm not joking, I'm telling you the truth, I probably hit 60, 70 dabs in an hour and in an evening because every person who would walk in, you know, to try my product, of course, I would dab with them. Yeah, you want to, everyone wants to do a dab with you. Of course, of they course. do, right? Everybody <laughs> wants to do a dab with Montel. So, you know, I did, I, I, I there was a couple of nights I can remember I, that us being out, you know, doing a presentation. And I know I stopped counting at like 35. And, you know, I might have hit 40, 50 dabs that one night and only remember that. You know, it, though I had good sense of what was going on around me, I will tell you that I just can remember some of those nights being 5, 30, 6 o'clock in the morning before I literally put my head down because, you know, I was just so blessed that I couldn't. I know. Uh, yeah, yeah. That It hits a different way, definitely. And when you start getting a lot, right, like in concentrates. So Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, now for you, now you say you do do a little flower. Um Mm -hmm. And I did do some reading of, of some of the literature you have about looking at the pesticides that are on the plants now. I mean, what are you mostly concerned about when it comes to cannabis consumption for the average user? Well, I think actually, like, uh, you know, I'm not so concerned about people having like a chronic event like I had. Um, I think that that's like unlikely in your like regulated markets with traditional cannabis products um uh like that 
you know, that that really was the partly a result of um, an untested ingredient and uh, and relying upon like a, a bad. I mean, I, I chose like a really bad black. I mean, they were diluting the hell out of their e-cigs. You know, I actually measured for myself what was in one of them just to confirm for myself what happened. Cause I actually had a hard time accepting, like I was so del self delusional. I had a hard time accepting that I had really gotten E Valley and then I had done it by buying bad E6 with vitamin E acetate. I was so ashamed, right? It's like right. A really, you know, it made me feel stupid and I already felt stupid. So, you know, what a, lot, what a lot of people don't understand is that there are some of those things still available in the black and gray market right now. Yeah, it occasionally turns up. It occasionally turns up. And these guys were diluting the hell out of their shit. I mean, it was more vitamin E acetate than it was THC. Got so it. it was a real bullshit product. And yeah, like, yeah. so it's definitely a confluence of bad things, right? I think that in the, I think that if you go to unregulated sources and uh, like you have more danger because um, in some of these unregulated sources for cannabis, kinds of products. Yeah, people are totally avoiding safety testing. They are producing it in facilities that are way substandard and they're doing real chemistry to make a lot of these products. All right. Like a lot of the knockoff vapes contain, they're not like a pure extract from cannabis, right? They are a chemically converted THC or other like cannabinoid like compound that gets people high. But uh, someone's done chemistry on that, but they haven't done it in a pharmaceutical grade chemical plant. That would bring it's me to the equivalent, question. Equivalent, you know? Yeah, that brings me to the question, ask the question like, what do you think about like Delta 8 and Delta 10? Yeah, so I really worry about those things. I mean, I, first of all, the compounds themselves have not been well enough studied for people to necessarily know everything about their safety. I mean, I think that de pure Delta-8 or pure Delta-10 most likely are probably not particularly hazardous, the same way THC isn't hazardous, right? Like, but, um, or CBD, right? So like- It's, um, it's the chemically pushed versions when they chain- when Yeah, they yeah to but you know, there are other synthetic cannabinoids that people have made before that turn out to be pretty harmful to the human heart. And um, that also have other that, you know, in occasion in some individuals have more profound psychoactive effects that are more risky or higher risk of overdose because their dosing is very, very fine and precise. Some 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 cannabinoid alternative compounds um, have affinities for the receptors that are a lot stronger than THC. So um, they, they kind of work differently, even. In a really low dose, they might feel a little bit like THC, but at a high dose, they could do something totally different. Sure. So um, as people get more experimental with this, they could come up with some products that are themselves, where the compound itself is harmful. Um, but also there's, yeah, a risk of the byproducts, right? And all of this stuff is kind of unknown. That's like, I think those are, those are some of the big risks. I think in... You know, now at this point, when I'm buying like weed from my local dispensary, like flour even, right? Like, what am I mainly worried about? Well, if someone spoofed the testing, then I could be exposed to some like microbes or it could be a little bit moldy. Maybe like it would taste funny. I had one batch one time that gave me a headache and I had it tested and it actually turned out it was contaminated with bacteria and some of the kind of gross ones. Like, yeah. So, um, you know, like. But I wouldn't say that was like a severe effect. But the thing is, like the chronic exposure to these things and chronic exposure to pesticides also can often lead over time to harm to people. Right. So it's very important to make sure that products are clean and that people can shop based on quality. Um, that's like the most important thing. Right. And I think that's like the thing that's the motivation that unites the consumers with the producers is that uh, the consumers and the producers, the good producers actually have an interest in the consumers being able to discern quality and the consumers also deserve to be able to discern quality so they can uh, get value for their dollar. But when consumers can shop on value and quality, then the best producers actually win. So um, that's what we try to make. Well, you know, let me let me ask a question about that. Have have 
did do you notice the industry or have you noticed does the industry embrace some of what you're saying or does the industry industry kind of keep you like this what's going on yeah you know what that's really interesting is actually like um and it, this reminds this reminds me of kind of other things so i'm kind of a, a this is so this is so funny because it's it's like a um it's a, it's a waste up interview right but like I actually wear tie dye pants and like bright colors, like almost every day. So like, and it turns out that what happens if you wear tie dye pants every day is people come up to you every once in a while and they tell you they really like your pants. Now there's probably a bunch of people who also hate them, but they never have the balls to talk to me. So gotcha. kind of the same way, like I'm sure there's a bunch of people who hate me, but I've mm. almost, I, I rarely hear from them. <laughs> right. And and they hate you because I mean you you've done a lot of talking about the fact that pesticides and residual pesticide layover on the plant, you know, could get into the smoke that people are yeah. you consuming. Let's talk about pesticides for a second. I thought, you know, especially in the legal market, skip the black market, because who knows what's going on over there. These guys could be using anything on their Oh plant. man, they they spray like hell there, right? They know nobody's looking. So Yeah, and nobody and nobody cares. And, and nobody's asking for a COA, so they don't want, they don't care. But right. from a legal market standpoint, you can still find pesticides in what is a legal market, and people don't even know that the pesticides are on their on their cannabis. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, it does. It it occasionally gets through. Um and one of the challenges is that right right now, um, nobody is really actively measuring enough to find out how often that happens. So um, we've seen that people do a couple of shelf tests, all right? Like a few have been published recently, and that's part of what motivated me to uh, um, write about pesticides. Um, but, um, you know, as people have, uh, you know, as people, but, people, but you know, they test like 20 products, right? Um, well, in one state. Well, how do I make a generalization about the risk of encountering pesticides based on that? Right, especially right. when there are hundreds of products. Yeah, yeah. So that's actually a big goal um, for me with the Institute of Cannabis Science. I founded it. Um, like my, my, my starting motivation was to recognize that I wanted information, all kinds of, I just wanted to know the average THC in cannabis that they sell in Massachusetts. And I realized there wasn't a way to look up the number. Not even, you know, it just right. wasn't kept. Nobody's right. checking. <laughs> Nobody right. kept track. And unless you individually go in a store and take a notebook out and write down every product that has a yeah. CLA on it and you can figure out what that level is, right? Yeah. And then I realized that this is a huge quality problem for people, right? Like there's actually always people. So like the compliance testing that people do, that we labs do, it might be a good idea. Um, it probably is a good idea, but like it's not enough to know everything about the safety of cannabis or to know, I mean, it's not enough to know about the consumer experience, all right? The way that you measure the consumer experience is you buy products from the retail space, right? And you have to buy it just like a consumer, right? It can, you can't test a product they give you it's not the same, right? Necessarily. I mean, maybe, but right, you don't know, right, right. Right. So that's the job is to, and, and I find actually is that, and I think I mentioned this earlier that the consumers and a lot of quality producers actually have a shared motivation in having clear signs of quality and having people be able, being able to shop on value. All right. Because in that scenario, if there's a level playing field and, consumers can shop for cannabis based on its actual quality instead of like a, 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 a piece of clip art on a website and a couple of numbers, then the best producers could actually win. Right. And you can't make so much money selling shitty weed. Right. Right. You know, but, but now it's going to, that's going to take a mindset change in an industry that hasn't shown that they give a damn. I'm, I'm just, I'm not being, a, yeah. a you know what I mean? I gotta tell you something. I think that, you know, I, I deal with a lot of different growers and talk to a lot of people who have their own farms and things. And not once have I heard any of them talk about, you know, let's bring the industry together, do a true, you know, industry organization that sets some standards and says, if this doesn't work, 
throw your shit out. I mean, honestly, that's really what should start to happen. We need to have a industry that's willing to come together and police itself. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, I actually think it's kind of understandable. I try to think about I try to think about this whole thing as like a system or like a big machine in a way. And um, I believe that this sort of thing in a way, like it can't come from the industry like on its own. It can't come only from companies. It needs to come from the civic space. That's why I founded a nonprofit. And the civic space is it's actually a different like lane. Um, right. It, it allows me to represent more the consumer focus, but I do think that there's a big challenge that cannabis companies also have because they don't understand something that is the responsibility usually of a company. Many companies in cannabis don't understand quality assurance yet. So, and quality assurance is going to the store, buying your own product and seeing how it turned out. Right. And actually doing it right. And I've actually almost never met a person in the cannabis industry who shops in a dispensary. Wow. Right. And so they don't think that much about how people are buying it. And that is a job. That's so that part is the response. These companies do need to get better at learning to serve their customers. That's part of the reason they're struggling is they don't think enough about customers. Like once that once that pallet of weed is like off the loading dock, most of these guys stop. They never think about it. Right. They don't care who processed it, what way, yeah. blah, 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 it doesn't matter. So that's the responsibility of the industry. They do need to figure that out and ask themselves more tough questions about like, how do we sell weed to other people who aren't just like enthusiastic stoners like us who wanted to grow weed? Right. right. Like, right? right. Like, so that, that's their job. But then the job for us is to like, you know, consumer protection has actually always come from the civic space. Like my model, one of my models is consumer reports. This is a nonprofit foundation that publishes a periodical that they buy stuff and they test it and they, they have a lab and they really test it out. And then they tell people how it actually was and they give right. things ratings. And right. when you do that, um, you know, when they started doing that, it was pretty inflammatory. Um, like Ralph Nader was one of the people on the board of the early consumer reports early on. Um, yeah. And um, they actually got sued a number of times. So they never lost because they didn't commit libel. I mean, they just told the truth and they backed it. They told the evidence. Right. right? So I recognized that if we have this same mechanism in cannabis and if we have someone testing things off the shelf and if we have someone test looking at the data systematically and telling just communicating to consumers how it works or explaining it all and if it's one source that everyone can find really easily and it's pretty fun then like maybe we can start to change things right it's definitely a slow right it's like trying to grow it's like trying to grow the future that we want right it's definitely like like when you're trying to when you're talking about educating your way to a solution you're talking about a slow solution <laughs> right right but right. we but ultimately we hope that this can shift the incentives i, I believe it can I, I actually think this can be really powerful and you know to before because we're gonna run out of time but i want to make sure mm. we get some of the like you know part of the, the reason why you've been thinking about this is again you've looked at cannabis and especially looked at it from the standpoint of, again, pesticides that have been used on the cannabis. But people don't understand that, you know, even if they cure it after they process it. Well, first off, the raw cannabis coming from a grower has been grown. And he supposedly has to test it before he can sell it to anybody else to process it. Mm -hmm. Well, at that moment of testing right there, you know, I, how much do you think people would be shocked that they found out how much pesticide, residual pesticide is left over? Well, I mean, I... I think I think a lot of people probably don't think about it or they just assume that it's not used. I mean, pesticides especially are such a funny thing in cannabis growing because it's 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 not a thing that people like to discuss. And the, the reason is because the, the are, are the laws about pesticides and agriculture are particularly specific in the U.S. Um, and they work in a funny way where uh, the basically a pesticide that's going to be used for um, an agricultural purpose actually needs to be sort of like certified for use on that crop with that dose in that way. Right. Um, and that certification is all based on research, but that research doesn't exist at all for cannabis. Right. So that means that there is no pesticide. 
that's certified for use on cannabis in a particular way, right? Remember, um, many pe most people would assume, I mean, almost all growers use pesticides, right? Or some kind of products, right? They, but they, like what they usually say is like, well, but I look, if, if they're one of the good ones, they say, well, I don't use it anytime close to flowering, right? You know, they say, but like, you know, it turns out. Well, a lot of them say they don't use it at all, which is not true. Yeah, yeah. And many, and I, I do believe that the best, the best is not to use it at all. I believe, I, I definitely believe the best is organic. And I definitely believe that um, scale organic production, I mean, is all, I mean, it's always going to be really hard. It's always, it's going to be really hard to produce at the scale that some of these companies imagine. But like, craft organic cannabis flower is going to be, I mean, that's going to be the best flower. And, you know, the, I actually sort of my long-term, like pro, if we get to speculations, my long-term speculation is that eventually flower will become more of like a, um, more of like a niche product. You know, others will continue to other product forms will continue to displace flower and flower will become more of like a connoisseur thing. And so, there won't, they'll actually, you know, let, shitty flour won't be able to persist as much because it'll be more like a choice, right? Um, that's like, you know, kind of, yeah, that's like, th that's kind of how I think about it right now. Um, so, well, you know, yeah. but I mean, like, you think about what's going on right now at the national level where, you know, we've been having discussions about the fact that, you know, the Fed's getting ready to step in, hopefully, you know, in the next year or so. And if they step in and let's say they 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 de you no know, they reschedule from schedule one to schedule three, most people think, oh my goodness, it's great, it's gonna open up the doors. It's not gonna open up the door. People gotta get to stop the stupid. First off, if they reschedule to schedule three, that means it falls right under the purview of the FDA. And the FDA and it becomes a prescribable medication. So therefore the FDA can step in and say, I'm sorry, none of these brands meet our standard. Then what do you do? Then every yeah. time you're carrying products, don't have to take it out and throw it into the dump. Then the dipsy dumps are out back. Um, you know, I mean, we're gonna we're gonna go through a, a learning curve and a, and a pains and and all kinds of craziness if they go to schedule three. Yeah, and the potential outcomes from schedule three. I mean, I've speculated about it also, and but I do think some of it is kind of unknowable, right? We have to see what happens. I mean, my, you know. My, my, my perspective is that, of course, like for for people who are in the state, like, you know, cannabis or like marijuana businesses, right? These state businesses um, like Schedule 3, it's not going to help them as much. Like the 280E thing is all some people are already starting to just claim the deductions anyway. Right. <laughs> and like, right. Um, you know, like, like and otherwise it, do, it doesn't it doesn't make anything else that they do legal. Um so, um, you know, I, I think it's not going to help them. It's going to really help this, like, it's going to help the growth of like these beverages and edibles. Um, because, uh, yeah, but, it, but it's going to, but if it helps, it's, it's just going to depend a lot on the appetite of FDA to like enforce any kind of standards, you know, I think, right. that, and, and you know, the FDA is not, they're overwhelmed. Well, they, but you know what, they're the kind of people who are going to want to take on more, even though they're overwhelmed. I mean, they're going to pull it out away from the DEA. It's going to come to the FDA, and they're going to try to flex their muscle and say, "We look, we're going to go back to the 2000, you know, um, two patent that the United States government has on cannabis, and anybody selling this particular type of cannabis, you need to take it off the shelves because we own the patent." I mean, this is going to open up just a Pandora's box that I don't think anybody in this industry is ready to deal with. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it definitely will. I mean, I think that the the big, you know, kind of the big future I see is that like most likely, <laughs> like it's kind of a sad story, but like most likely most of the cannabis products in the future are going to be like cheap, low grade stuff that comes from dist distillate, right? And that distillate is going to be mostly hemp derived cannabinoids that are converted. I mean, the hemp will be grown, extracted, and the chemistry done in China where they make nearly all of the active pharmaceutical ingredients that come from herbal sources. Right. So, um, you know, and then that's gonna, you know, get 
put into beverages here, which is going to really like be a mate, you know, I think that young, you know, I think that young people are going to interact with cannabis so much differently. I mean, right. Like my first experience was smoking like this shitty weed off of an aluminum can. Right. Like, nobody's going to do that now. Nobody. Right. Right. So like, you know, like, like it's going to be totally, you know, that future is going to be really different, I think. And like smoking pot, like I know it is, uh, you know, kind of is, is going to be, it's going to be more niche, you know, right. that's what I think. Sure. You know, I mean, now, they, and, and even when it comes to smoking pot, unless you find a really good grower or a grower who's testing, I mean, people have to worry about things like moles and aspergillus and things like that, right? Well, but the thing is, like, when you extract that, when you extract those things, um, a lot of the microbial contaminants in cannabis that you don't want, the reason you don't want them there isn't because of the microbes themselves. It's because of all the shit that they put in the weed when they're just from the process of living. They excrete a bunch of toxins and those toxins can be extracted with the cannabinoids and the extraction process even has the potential to concentrate them. So that can be pretty harmful. And again, it's the chronic exposure to low levels of those toxins that's, you know, can sensitize people, maybe make their asthma a little worse, eventually increase their risk of cancer. Those are all like downstream consequences. It's usually not enough the only time that moldy cannabis is enough to make someone acutely ill and have an asthma attack is usually when they're working with it. And that's happened several times. Right. Um, in, in right. Including a famous case, Lorna McMurray, who died. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, I heard about that. That was really crazy. And so, you know, over the course of, again, you know, as we argue schedule one, schedule three, descheduling completely, I mean, how do you see your organization impacting the legal industry? Yeah, I think that, I mean, my number one goal is that people can get like an honest review about cannabis and know what they want to buy with from someone who's not trying to sell them weed because mm -hmm. that's what they need. They just need some honest information and someone just take them aside. Hey buddy, look, what are you looking for? All right, it's this, hey, look, if you're, you know, if you want something good, do this one. Don't buy it from those guys. They tend to have shitty stuff. Um, I, you know, we want, like, I mean, our our missions and our and our and our main visions are like a, a world where um, people, you know, where cannabis companies and testing labs compete on quality, right? <laughs> not on cheating, right? right? Sure. And not 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 on loopholes. How about that? You know, it's just really simple that. stuff. It make it easy for people to buy good weed, right? right? Not like super hard. Like I, you know, buy 10 products to get one good one, right? Get rid of pre-rolls full of shitty, moldy, outdoor, dried out stuff, right? Or at least just make it, you know, just tell people, hey, that's what's in that one. Right. Right. Because it's actually pretty easy to know. <laughs> it, just wow. takes one, it just takes someone telling them who doesn't have the vested interest. Right. And that's why, that's why it has to come from like the nonprofit space. So yeah, I view it as sort of like an engineering thing, right. And try to change that, change the incentive structure, make there be a price, make there be a price for being a dirty lab. Right. By having an easy website to find where people can see that. Yeah, I like that idea that you had earlier about, you know, consumer protection organization or, you know, um, where, People can just go and find out, you know, and, and there should be some organization just randomly running around the country, grabbing products off the shelves, testing it and giving a, a legitimate assessment of what they find. Yeah. Yeah. That's that. That's that's the whole idea. That's. Yeah. Give people honest data about weed. Absolutely. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Right. And, 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 and you know, in, in turn. Right. It's not it's for consumers and then give researchers an easy place to find all the explanations and honest data. Right. So, right. um, you know, like the next thing that we're setting up on our website, we're just kind of, we just rolled out a new version of our website in the last day. And, um, and, uh, now it's, sort of, it's structured more like a news website. Got it. Get out the website, give out the website right now. Yeah. It's cansci.org. That's C A N N S C I dot O R G. Very okay. simple. And, um, yeah, yeah. You know, you can get, you so, so 
now what we're doing is is uh, so we have some explainers and um, so, uh, and a couple of guides and uh, about like what are the hazards of like defrauding um, of consumers and how do you shop for weed. Um, one of our next things that we're going to set up is a is a a back end for researchers so that they can get raw data files that we've collected so that they can do their own work to figure out and answer whatever questions they have. Because one of the problems we want to solve is this lack of good research on cannabis. And as I started doing research myself in a university, I did what I always did. I got a bunch of scientific journal articles and read them. And you know what? That was garbage. <laughs> what a terrible way, right? What I had to do was spend like kind of a year or so embedded wow. in the industry. Sure. In order to really learn it, I spent a bunch of time at a testing lab. I should shout out Mike Khan and Yasha Khan from MCR Labs, who taught me a lot. Um, Jill Carrero and Jeremy Kletke, they've mentored me a lot. And Jill got me a box from Orange Photonics. So I Hello. shout out a couple of those people who um, got me started. And Trent Hancock, he taught me a lot. So sure. um, he's like a real pioneer of consumer safety, and consumer protection. Well, well, so. well look, buddy, I, I'm I'm a, I'm out of time, and yeah, yeah, I could talk to you for hours. I could talk but, to you for hours. So I want to talk to you for a couple more hours. Would you mind coming back? I would love to come back. It's been really fun. Thanks for letting me get on my soapbox a little bit. Oh no, come on! I want you back on your soapbox, and let's get in front of the jump. I mean, man, I. I I, there's, I, I barely got through even a third of the questions that I had for you. And so I've got a ton more questions and I'm sure that my viewers have the same number of questions because, you know, you're parting some truth out there, my brother. I mean, this is what I think we all need to hear and understand. So I got I to gotta thank you, Dr. Rossum, for sharing your expertise and your insights to all the listeners. And um, this has been a really, really, really great episode of Let's Be Blunt with Montel. So I want all of those at home to continue to stay tuned. I got to thank you for being a part of the show today, sir. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you so much for having me, man. I really, I, I can't appreciate it enough. It's been so much fun. It's been so much fun. So I'm going to definitely reach out to our folks and tell them to reach out to you. You know, I, I'd love to have you back in a couple of weeks because I think that, you know, I'd like to put you up there and let people be able to absorb what we've talked about so far today and then come back a week later and catch you again. Okay. Right on, man. Right on, man, for sure. You stay well. You take care of yourself. You keep doing what you're doing. And let's try to put the brains together, my friend, because I'm telling you, I think you are on to something here without a doubt. All we got to do is get funding to make it happen. Right on. All right. Hey, thank you, Montel. Yes, sir. You be well. You take care of yourself. And you guys, make sure you tune in to the next episode of Let's Be Blunt with Montel. Thanks for joining me on Let's Be Blunt with Montel. Please make sure you're subscribed and hit the bell to be notified when new episodes post each week. We'd love to hear your feedback also, so please send us your comments.